The Aurelia Museum of Art and History is located on the traditional territory of the Anishinaabeg. The Anishinaabeg include the Ojibwe, Ottawa, and Potawatomi nations, collectively known as the Three Fires Confederacy. We respect and observe the long and enduring presence of Indigenous peoples, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit on this land. Their teachings and stewardship, culture, and way of life have shaped our city's unique identity. Welcome to uh, our presentation this evening on the Mackinac Jacket, a Canadian folk costume. Um, my name is Lindsay. I'm the History Programming Coordinator here at the museum. And it is my pleasure to welcome John Savage. Um, so uh, we've worked with John before, but John um, approached us about putting together an installation about the Mackinac Jacket and the the ties that it has to Aurelia and um, the importance it has as a garment all across Canada. John has been kind enough to join us this evening to tell us the story of the Mackinac jacket and it really is an amazing history. So um, John, thank you for being here this evening. Thank you. And I just want to thank the museum again for uh, uh, hosting one of my exhibits and, uh, and, and presentations, because I think you guys have done a lot as a small museum to uh, reach out and to listen to your Indigenous uh, contributors. And uh, I know at times we've had to uh, have a dialogue about, you know, uh, about the needs of the Indigenous community to tell their own story. And that's really important for us. So thank you. Um, without further ado, should we get started, John? Great, sure. Okay, amazing. So uh, the first question that I have for you, um, maybe a little bit unfair because it's a massive question. Can you introduce us to the Mackinac jacket and tell us the story of the creation of this garment? Okay, so to, to start off, the Mackinac jacket is part of a 400 year old blanket coat tradition in Canada. And, um, and this tradition started out uh, uh, almost right from the beginning in the 1600s when uh, the uh, Europeans had to trade things for fur pelts in the, in the, uh, the, uh, the fur trade. So <clears throat> they found that uh, there was a demand for uh, utilitarian pots and pans and cutlery or utensils and axes and things like that. Uh, but there is also a need for uh, for uh, wool uh, blankets, and these wool blankets uh, would replace uh, would replace blankets that could be worn made out of roots and and fibers. Uh, out west, there was uh, uh, in BC there were uh, blankets made out of uh, the hair of or the wool of dogs, little dogs that they would breed for for their curly warm hair that they could harvest from the, their bellies. And, and weave into what uh, were, you know, couch and type sweaters and uh, blankets. So there was a long tradition of wearing blankets, but the wool blankets that would come from Europe were uh, of higher quality. So uh, the demand was there. So that this was something that, uh, that the Europeans could trade uh, uh, with, with the First Nations. And the First Nations uh, often would um, <clears throat> request different designs and colors. So you had, uh, it, certain colors more popular with certain groups or designs, and even th uh, the thicknesses and weaves. So the, for example, the uh, thicker uh, um, uh, blankets of what was uh, the you know, where, where the Mackinac jacket was being developed. Those later would be adapted quite well into into coats. So um, here we see in this photo or this old photo here, uh, we see a. a it looks like a chief dressed up in uh, in his chief's uh, cost or regalia, which was uh, looked like a beaver uh, felt top hat, and uh, and I can see maybe a blanket uh, uh, used there as well. The uh, fellow to uh, our right there uh, is wearing 
uh, a capote. And a capote was a kind of a cloak with a hood, um, with arms, with sleeves. And this was, this was originally fashioned after the French sailors that would come into uh, Canada. So th these uh, blanket coats evolved into a capotes. Here we have an image uh, by uh, the, the uh, artist uh, Cornelius Griegoff, which many people would probably know. And um, this, is a, uh, this is a woman that's selling uh, moccasins and she's going to market with uh, a blanket wrapped around her. So, you know, the, this, is, this is a common way you would use that blanket. You might even use that blanket later for sleeping on as well. How the Mackinac coat, or sometimes it's called the Mackinac jacket, got started, uh, well, it was also building upon um, the uh, blanket or the, 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 the designs that were in the area at the time. There was a, a Metis and First Nation uh, community there. Uh, it's at this. So when I say Mackinac, I mean Michilimack, or um, there's uh, which which means uh, Turtle Turtle Island. So Michilimack, Michilimackinac is the uh, the French variation of the Adawa term, and uh, and then that that's at the Straits of Lake Upper Lake Huron on, on the western uh, tip of it, where it flows into Michigan, Lake Michigan. So right around there, uh, that was a narrows that would have been a natural place for a lot of people who were traveling between Lake Michigan and Lake Huron, and then Lake Huron connecting to the Ottawa River and, and the Ottawa River connecting down to the St. Lawrence where they, they could trade with, with Europe. So uh, this area became a very intense area. It was um, uh, with a lot of population, but also um, there were uh, infections as well that could wipe out the community. So right around in, in the 17th and 18th century, the French uh, had, uh, had established a fort on the mainland there, and uh, Fort Michelin Mackinac. And these are the kinds of costumes you would have seen coming and going from there. And uh, so you see on the, uh, on, uh, in the middle there, you see uh, a, a chief in his regalia, and it, and, and it, and it looks like he's wearing a, what you would call a frock coat. It's a tailored coat with uh, a sash around uh, the waist, used as a belt, and um, and that would be patterned off of the after the uh, the French uh, military designs. So uh, it was one way of distinguishing yourself as a chief. And we'll see a slide later on uh, where th where that's the case too. And then you would see uh, different kinds of shirts with, with frills. Now the thing about Indigenous people back then or the First Nations is they they already had a tradition of sewing they would make all sorts of garments they would make moccasins they would make leggings they would make uh, uh, different cloaks so th this this wasn't new to them but uh, what was new to them were, were the different kinds of designs and fibers and colors that that the Europeans could uh, trade with them for so uh, this this would have been these costumes are the typical kinds you might see around the the, the fort where there was a, a, a fur trading post as well and again on the right you see uh, uh, a fellow there wearing uh, what looks like a, maybe a buckskin underneath uh, the, the, uh, a, a, a Hudson Bay blanket or a Northwest Company blanket there. So the island that I'm talking about, Mac, here it's called Mackinac, but it's actually pronounced Mackinac because the French, uh, they leave the sea uh, silent. And <clears throat> as you can see, it looks a little bit like a turtle. So it's Turtle Island, you know. Um, uh, that's that's what it's that's what the origin of the name is from. So it was the original Turtle Island, and uh, this is where you know they had uh, the French had a fort. Then the British took that over after after uh, the Treaty of Paris in 1763, and then after the War of Independence, it was handed over to the the Americans when they drew the boundaries, and then in the War of 1812. Um, uh, that, that was the site of the first uh, battle uh, that uh, our Canadian side won. Um, when the battle broke out, uh, or when the war broke out, it was supposedly the most unpopular war America's ever uh, led in terms of some popular support from the beginning. Um, it was also called Madison's War. He thought he could walk into Canada 
uh, with open arms and maybe they might have a big parade like Putin thought he could walk into Ukraine with. So I find it kind of interesting looking back then because some of the similarities between what Canada went through and what Ukraine is going through, it's, it's similar. It's, it's a war that forged Canada. Before that, there were disparate groups. There was only about, I understand, about 1,800 uh, British regulars that were in, uh, in Canada at that time. They had to depend on the uh, goodwill of their, uh, of their subjects being uh, the French that they had just uh, uh, won Lower and Upper Canada from. Uh, but also the First Nations and the Métis uh, that lived in this area as well. So uh, what happened was after the war was declared, uh, General Brock uh, enlisted the help of, uh, of a fellow named uh, William McKay, I believe it is, and he paddled with his voyageurs in a, in a dispatch canoe, with one of the fastest ones they could paddle, uh, a set, um, do a stroke every second, so that's 60 strokes a minute, and they could go for uh, 17 hours even. Uh, so they got up to uh, where uh, Captain Charles Roberts had a, a garrison. And this garrison was made up of British regulars. They were called, actually, they were called um, the Veterans Battalion. So it was the 10th Royal Veterans Battalion. Uh, the old name for the Veterans Battalion was the Invalids Battalion. Uh, that was uh, changed because uh, it didn't sound so nice. It was a little bit insulting to the guys that were in it. But basically, it was older soldiers or those that were injured uh, and that couldn't serve on the front lines of a battle anymore. And so they gave them this kind of light garrison duty on in, in the uh, uh, hinterland. So this uh, post that Captain uh, Charles Roberts uh, uh, was in command of was called uh, Fort St. Joseph. It was on St. Joseph Island in the St. Mary's River, just downstream from Sault Ste. Marie, uh, where that is today. And it wasn't, it was like a day's paddle from uh, Fort Mackinac. And, uh, and so after the, after the uh, War of 18, or War of Independence, the, the British garrison had moved from Fort Mackinac to uh, Fort St. Joseph. It was a very cold, windswept island. And uh, the last time they had coats made uh, was in, or coats that were supplied to them was 1807. So Captain Charles Roberts, uh, uh, upon seeing the last uh, supply ship leaving in, on, in November, uh, he wrote back on November 20th to his uh, to headquarters back in uh, Quebec and said that, you know, he, he's desperate for these coats for his garrison. So. He took the risk of, of um, contracting uh, a Métis fellow. His name is John Askin Jr., who is the shopkeeper for the uh, Indian Department, to um, to uh, to make some great coats for his contingent. And uh, John Askin Jr. also took a risk because he had to take uh, he, he had to uh, take credit for this. You know, this was all done on credit. There's a possibility that the the British military wouldn't have paid for it. So he basically fashioned these great coats and he even put in some uh, little design features that made it, them look more military. And, uh, and these were very, very popular because the thickness of the wool blankets in that area was just the right uh, thickness uh, for, for these coats. And th they were full length coats uh, largely, but we call them, uh, we call that the first Mackinac coat because the, the next step was pretty simple. So in, uh, in, in July, on July 17th, uh, Captain Roberts enlisted the help of his, uh, of his contingent, which was uh, approximate, approximately uh, 47 British, British soldiers. He enlisted, uh, along with the help of uh, William McKay, 150 uh, Canadian or Métis uh, fur traders and voyageurs. Now these fur traders, uh, a lot of them lived in the area, and you see their names all over. Uh, these family names are still all over the place. I used to work in Clarny, and you see them in the graveyard there, and, and the people walk, you meet them in the bars, they're still there. Um, so these names are, are old, old Métis names. Uh, and they also enlisted these voyageurs that were passing through the area. And one of those voyageurs was my ancestor, uh, Antoine uh, Godard de La Pointe. 
Uh, I'll talk about him a bit later. He was 15 years old. The Northwest Company, which was the Montreal Fur Trading Company that uh, operated in the area, they were uh, short of uh, voyagers, so they started hiring younger and younger voyagers. And uh, Antoine was uh, enlisted when he was 14 in Montreal, and he, he paddled all the way up to uh, what is now Thunder Bay. And on the return trip in July, uh, the War of 1812 broke out, and uh, Captain Roberts uh, enlisted him uh, in to to help him on this uh, first expedition against the the American forces. So along with uh, 300 Ojibwa or Chippewa, Ottawa, uh, and another 110 Sioux, uh, Menominee, and Winnebago, uh, they uh, they they uh, took off in in 70 war canoes and 10 bateaux and a schooner, and they uh, arrived at Fort Mackinac and. After firing just a few shots, the uh, the Americans surrendered because Captain Roberts said to the uh, uh, sent a message that you know I, I can I can stop my uh, British forces from if you're you're going to surrender in the middle of a battle in which your families are going to be involved I, I can stop the British and I know a little bit of French so I think I could stop the French but I'm not sure if I can stop the uh, the various First Nations because I don't really know their language too too well. And uh, so anyway, that was enough to convince them to, to surrender. So they took over that fort and it was relatively peaceful. I don't think anyone was killed actually, uh, but it was a great victory. And the significance for Canada right there, and this ties back to the Mackinac coat and the uh, importance of it as a symbol of Canada, is it was the first time that these different peoples that became Canada um, made a conscious decision that we would fight for this land together, and we would fight together as a uh, in a in, sh in our shared interest. Now the British had a military interest, but the uh, the others had an interest in terms of the fur trade and trying to protect their fur trade from from the Americans coming up and taking it over. Which is interesting because uh, Jacob Astor, who was an, the uh, owner of the Southwest uh, uh, Fur Trading Company, he actually uh, sent a message up to uh, Fort St. Joseph as well to warn them about the war breaking out because he was against the war on the, even though he was an American. Uh, he had interests on both sides of the border and he didn't want those compromised by, uh, by um, President Madison's uh, folly here. So anyway, the, uh, one of the first things they had to do uh, at Fort Mackinac, getting ready for the, the fall with all these new uh, warriors around the fort, is to clothe them. So they had to make more uh, great coats uh, out of these blankets. But one of the, uh, one of the uh, runners, and these are people that uh, run messages back and forth, asked that the coat be cut just above the knee so that he could snowshoe through the, the snow dress more easily. And that actually became the more distinctive style of the Mackinac coat in years to come. Although you can still find the longer ones around too. So that shorter uh, coat um, uh, became very important. Um, it was, uh, now there's a couple of Métis connections there, influences there. So the coat, um, basically coming out of the First Nations tradition using styles from Europe, and it was uh, basically designed by, uh, well, commissioned by uh, John Askin Jr. and his uh, French, possibly Métis wife, uh, Madeline, uh, Pelche uh, Askin, and and then seamstresses were about ten of them, and they were a mix, they believe, of white and Métis women. So you get this you get this interesting uh, blend here. So it you know the, the Mackinac coat it it could be claimed uh, its origins by Métis uh, British certainly, but also out of the uh, the First Nation and the French traditions of blanket coats. So here we see in this slide. Um, we see uh, later on uh, the the, bl the blanket coat, or in this in this case, it's uh, it's kind of like a Quebec version of the Mackinac coat, but very very similar. The two kind of morph together. Um, this is a snowshoe club that was in Montreal, and the interesting thing about the snowshoe club, it was made up largely of, of British um, settlers that came to Montreal, and one of the things that the British settlers wanted to do was to adopt. The identity of Canadians. They want to, you know, they're part of the big British Empire, but they wanted to distinguish themselves from other parts of the British Empire. And one of the ways to do it was to go native, as you say. And one of the ways of going native would be to try and dress 
like the uh, peoples that had been here before. So considering that at this point, the uh, blanket coat tradition was 300 years, this is how they dressed and they had a great time. I love this photograph because it just sort of uh, exemplifies, I think the spirit of the time. And uh, here they are, they're, uh, it's, a, it's a recreational use of the Mackinac jacket or the blanket coat. And it's, uh, and it's a form of Canadian identity appropriation. So it's, it's one way that, that, that newcomers to the land could, uh, could blend in by, by wearing this coat. And a great way to wear it and, and uh, stay warm. Here we have Lady Aberdeen, and she was the Governor General's wife. And when she came to uh, Canada, she wrote a, an article um, about uh, the blanket coat. And, uh, and I'll read a little bit here. Um, she wrote this article that was in the, uh, in the Montreal Daily Star on January 26, 1895. And she says, there is a material made in Canada called the blanket cloth, which is admirably fitted for winter wear. It is in fact an adaption of blanketing worn by the Indians and has been greatly in vogue among the merry tobogganers. But we are disposed to think that it is not sufficiently appreciated or worn by the general public. We think that the members of the government house staff never look so well as when they turn out in their dark blue blanket coats with the many colored scarves, which would have been sashes, woven in times gone by, the French peasants wound round their waists. It is a pity that a photograph of our own family, which is the one we see here, uh, could not have been rendered in colors to illustrate the variety that may may be obtained in these costumes. So there you go. I'm um, too bad for Lady Aberdeen that uh, color film hadn't uh, come out at that point, but it's an, it's an interesting uh, image there. And, and there's a lot of different uh, references she makes to, to blanket coats uh, in, 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 in other uh, journals, but it's, uh, there she is in Ottawa. And the funny thing about Ottawa, it's on the court, kind of the boundary between Montreal, you know, uh, Upper Canada and, and the blanket coat tradition that's more around the Great Lakes. So there's a bit of an overlap, which, which we'll get into later. But some of their, their coats there were, uh, were, were more of the French style. Now, after the War of 1812, what we have is um, they redraw the boundaries and Fort Mackinac is on the American side. And so they relocate to Fort Drummond on Drummond Island. And, and then a few years later in the 1820s, they realize, well, the border actually, Drummond Island is actually on the American side too. And so a lot of the uh, veterans of the War of 1812, so we have uh, French Canadian voyagers like my ancestor, we have Métis, we have uh, First, First Nations, uh, they disperse. Now this uh, map shows the dispersal of the Métis from the Sault Ste. Marie, Drummond Island, Mackinac Island, uh, area after 1815. Uh, and you see, which is really interesting, is a large number of them in this in the bottom right corner go to a place called Penetanguishene, which was a, a British military port. And the British wanted uh, loyalists down there. So the best loyalists in that area were the um, were, were, were the were the Metis from that they had fought alongside with. So uh, you also see that uh, some of these people went uh, towards uh, Eastern Ontario. They would have uh, traveled down the, uh, through, through uh, the North Bay area, Lake Nipissing and, and down to Mattawa. And so some of the, their travels ended up that way. And with them, what they did was they brought the Mackinac coat or the Mackinac jacket with them. And so when you consider the popularity of the, of the Mackinac coat and how it spread, it mirrors very closely the uh, dispersal of the Great Lakes Métis uh, to other areas in the Métis, what they call now the Métis Nation, which is kind of a, an area um, of boundaries, moving boundaries, because it's still being de debated, that stretch all the way from Aurelia, perhaps at the lowest uh, level, all the way up into uh, Northern British Columbia, maybe even the Yukon. So here is an interesting photo. This is Louis Riel wearing a Mackinac coat. And this sort of ties in, well, how did the Mackinac coat get to the Red River Valley? And one theory I have, so it's just a theory, it has to be proven still, but 
um, one of the battles that the uh, contingent at um, Fort Mackinac um, uh, went, you know, did a, a, uh, an expedition to was down to a place called Prairie des Chiens, um, which was on the uh, Mississippi River. Now, the R Mississippi River, uh, that area was known for having a Métis community. And in that Métis community, my, my cousin, Diane Godor, has been doing some family research on this. Um, and we, we've found that there's a, a strong likelihood that uh, Antoine's older brothers were living with his uh, uncle down there, had migrated there, and were intermarrying in with the uh, local Sioux uh, population there. So his, um, his uncle uh, became, uh, was one of the uh, first, first settlers of that area and was known as a translator. And which is kind of interesting because that's what uh, uh, later happened with uh, Antoine's son. They, they became, uh, or sons, they became translators, interpreters as well. So anyway, here's another picture. Um, this is, uh, this shows a, a blanket coat, uh, perhaps that was turned into a, a, a chieftain's coat. And here he is holding what looks like to be a giant shilling. So this is a shout out to my shilling cousins on the Rama, uh, Chippewas of Rama Reserve. And this is where some, some people believe that where Chief Big Shilling, our common ancestor with the Godors and Shillings, may have got his name. So back then there were these peace medals handled, handed out and they would have been proudly worn uh, by chiefs for uh, good deeds done during uh, wars or uh, treaties. Uh, or, or favors that they were given. And it was, uh, an, it was uh, a symbol of friendship and a symbol of, um, of partnership in this new adventure that was becoming Canada. Um, here's the uh, grave headstone that we put up, uh, the family for Antoine Godard, or, or Antoine Godard de la Pointe. And, uh, and uh, he's not buried in this graveyard, but we just put the headstone there. And Mary's not buried there either. She's buried in a pioneer cemetery. And, and one of my cousins, Joe Gesso, uh, thinks that Antoine might be buried under the hockey arena in Rama. So uh, anyway, there you go. Uh, but it's an interesting story. She ended up being buried with the, the white pioneers and he ended up being buried with his Chippewa in-laws. Um, and that's kind of the story there. So Antoine, anyway, he would have brought his Mackinac coat uh, to the area. He was a fur trader, and so that would, would have been one of the staple items he could have been trading throughout his region. You know, he had to trade furs for, for items, and, and wool was a, a wool coat would have been a very good thing to trade uh, with, his, uh, with his Chippewa uh, trading partners. So um, because he married Chief Big Schilling's daughter, Mary Schilling, he had access to uh, a fur trade area that would have stretched from New Market or Holland Landing, all the way up to Lake Nipissing and Killarney, perhaps, and uh, including Muskoka, Muskoka, which was named after uh, uh, the, the great chief uh, Yellowhead. So, um, so John, on that note, um, how did you actually become interested in the story of the Mackinac jacket? Well, I think I became interested in it unconsciously. So, as a kid, I just remember seeing people walking around wearing you know, uh, Buffalo check shirts. It was kind of a style that you saw in the 60s and 70s and 80s and it just carried on. And then you'd see all sorts of different people wearing it and lumberjacks. And, but I also remember like a lot of my uh, relations there in Aurelia, um, they were wearing, they had their own Mackinac uh, coats. So here, here's one that was worn by my great grandfather. And it was similar to the ones that uh, my grandfather's cousins would wear. And one of my uh, co cousins was saying that his dad had one hanging on the hook by the door. That would have been Reggie uh, Godor. And, uh, and, and this one was uh, owned by uh, my great grandfather, as you see in that picture there. He was a professional rower and um, of international claim. Uh, he was the North American uh, sculling champion in 1902, it says there. Uh, I later found out through uh, doing uh, research that he was. Uh, also a professional wrestler, and he uh, also established different sports clubs around uh, around North America, including uh, Port Hope and in 
in Elmer, Quebec here, uh, he started up what became, I believe, the uh, Champlain Golf Club. Uh, so anyway, that's that's kind of neat. Like like his uh, Métis uh, for, forebears, he, he traveled around a lot. And uh, Aurelia was his kind of base of operations, which he would uh, circle back to uh, every few, few few years or every so often during the, the season. So, yeah. Um, and of course, Charles, not the only famous rowing Godor, eh? <laughs> well, no, in our, in our family line, it's just Charles. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I get it. His older brother, Jake, got him into rowing. In fact, all the brothers were involved in some form of professional rowing, but Jake was the most successful. And Jake was the uh, perhaps the first Indigenous international sports figure, uh, which hasn't been recognized that much. Uh, but he was uh, back in the uh, late 1890s and early uh, 1900s. He was the world champion in, in sculling, and he was known as uh, one of the fastest of his generation. And uh, him and Charles would often row doubles together or in quad, uh, in fours or quads. So, um, yeah, so they were, that, that was the family uh, profession. It was easier than logging, let's say. Uh, because <laughs> they did build a lot of their muscle up, they say, uh, from, from working in the, in the bush. And yeah. uh, they also did a lot of fishing guiding and hunting guiding as well. Um, <laughs> the, the story, the family story, how else I got interested in it was a couple other reasons. First of all, I, I remember my grandmother handing me this coat uh, from my great grandfather, and she, she said, "You know, it's a it's a Cars Mackinac," and as if I knew what that meant, and uh, I didn't know what that meant. So, I, I, I years later, I, I looked it up. What was Cars Mackinac all about? And here we have uh, this next slide. This is the a stamp or an embosser from the Cars Mackinac company, and this symbolized this. This was a company they they uh, created uh, work clothes. They sold the man, manufactured work clothes in Aurelia for uh, the law, pro, workers, outdoor workers, uh, 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 lumberjacks, farmers, hunters, uh, fishing guides, and uh, so it was. A, it was a, a big business, and here we go. That, look at that style, isn't that something? Lots of pockets for ammunition and small game, and you had a little flap there to um, to put the collar up in high winds and. Unlike a hood, you could actually uh, to move your head around and, and see your prey that you're going to try and shoot. Or if you're uh, in a war zone, you can actually uh, keep a good lookout for the enemy. So, uh, yeah, so lumbermen's and miners' clothing. And then later we see that the Cars Mackinac company has did a lot of uh, outdoor uh, clothing companies. They started uh, marketing their Mackinac coats to recreational athletes. And here we have an excellent uh, photograph taken in on Lake Kuchiching in Aurelia, where they're wearing Cars Mackinac coats in some of these cases here. And uh, so, yeah, that was a very popular use for the coats. We see uh, lots of photos online of different teams wearing Cars Mackinac style uh, uh, Mackinac jackets. The uh, Cars Mackinac company uh, operated between 1897 and 1963. And uh, they uh, also uh, sold their, their coats to the Hudson Bay Company. So um, the Curse Mackinac Company really like locally helped to popularize this garment. And um, it became especially popular as somewhat of a uniform for lumbermen. Um, so can you talk a bit more about that, please, John, that connection? Okay, well, the thing about the, the uh, Mackinac coat was it was designed to resist uh, cold weather. It was uh, weather, it was water resistant because it's wool and um, it was very durable. So of course it would be used by outdoors people of all kinds. But what we saw in the later 1800s is that the, uh, the mid 1800s onwards, uh, actually in Ottawa it was perhaps the earliest time was, was in the 1820s. The, the lumber industry just took off and you needed a lot of workers up there in the, in, in the woods uh, dressed appropriately. So the nice thing about wool is it, it vents a lot better than, uh, than skins do. And uh, it is fairly water resistant and, and tough. And uh, now the interesting thing about Cars Mackinac was started by William Cars who grew up in uh, the Ottawa Valley. 
and uh, his brother actually started a, a, fashion, a men's fashion shop, I believe, down in Cornwall. So this fellow here, this depiction is um, a fellow called Joe Monferron, or Joseph Monferron, and as uh, some people might know him as uh, Big Joe Mafra. And uh, so this fellow was six foot four. He was from Montreal. He came from a family of big men. At the age of 16, uh, he was invited to uh, take on the Canadian boxing champion. Uh, and he uh, knocked him out with one punch. And uh, from then on, the legend grew. And this fellow uh, lived on my side of the river in the National Capital Region in, in, uh, in Hull. And uh, he would uh, often represent his, uh, uh, his French Canadian uh, uh, lumber, lumberjacks in, in battles with the, uh, the Irish uh, lumberjacks. So uh, there's a lot of good stories about this fellow and his legend was carried with the lumberjacks uh, throughout uh, the lumber areas. So, you know, lumberjacks would move around too, you know, and uh, so some of them, uh, ended up uh, going out west, and, and, and it's believed that the, this statue of Paul Bunyan was inspired by uh, Joe Mafran or Big Joe Mafra, and, uh, and Stomping Tom Connors, by the way, he, he has a good song about that, so I won't sing that. And, uh, but you, there you go, you have this, uh, this other uh, uh, person dressed in a similar way. The, the, it's, it's important to know that the uh, that, uh, red black. Uh, stripe. It's called the um, uh, Buffalo check design. And that was part of the Mackinac jacket design right from the beginning, as far as I know. And, uh, and originally when they were commissioned for Captain Charles Robertsman, they, they wanted blue coats, but they didn't have blue coats. They had this Buffalo check design and they had red. So that's what they got. And uh, if, so can you imagine some people going into battle dressed like that? That would have been pretty, pretty stylish, you would think, for that, for that time. Mm -hmm. Now, um, speaking of folk heroes like Joe Mofferal, um, you have described the Mackinac jacket to me as Canadian folk costume, and that's right on the title of your installation. Um, so, John, why do you think the Mackinac jacket qualifies as a Canadian folk costume? I think the Canadian, I think the Mackinac coat is a good folk costume for Canada because it's worn pretty well coast to coast. You see fishermen wearing it, or uh, you see lumberjacks, you see hunters, outdoors people, you see it worn in urban centers, uh, you see it all over the place. It's um, you know, it may have started out as a Métis uh, and, and War of 1812 veterans garment, but it's been adopted uh, in so many different uses. And it's something that was recognized as, as uh, a folk costume by early British um, uh, uh, settlers in the Montreal area with the, with the Montreal Snowshoeing Club, but also by the Governor General and his family. So it was clearly understood that this was part of a of a 400 year old tradition. Uh, they may not have known the whole story, but it's an unconscious, it's an unconscious identity that we have with that coat. It, it, we're drawn to it and it, it, have, it keeps uh, remaining popular in generation after generation. It's something that reminds us of our ancestors and of a time when Canada was uh, known as a, a place where lumberjacks and hunters and, uh, and uh, outdoors people would uh, enjoy themselves. And what we hear, see here is this advertisement, uh, in, this was around the turn of the century perhaps, or maybe the 1920s, where they're trying to uh, market the, the, the Mackinac coat uh, for urban uh, users as well. And this happened around the time when uh, in the, the turn of the century, the, the youth got into the Mackinac coat. Uh, they, they started seeing it as a fashion uh, item that they could claim. And when the youth got in it, then, then it just spread to all generations. Uh, so that you see the continued use going throughout the whole, through, through the 1800s and into the 1900s. And I would say it's a Canadian folk costume because you don't see people wearing capotes that much walking down the street anymore. 
and you might not see the ones with the sashes walking along the street, but you will see Mackinac coats. And the Mackinac coat uh, was created and became popularized right around the time that you know from that Canada was becoming a nation. And as I said, that perhaps it must it may have been uh, the Battle of Fort Mackinac that was the the spark that that in which we recognized that uh, that these different peoples needed one another to fend off a common enemy and to protect the land that they all care deeply about. So here we have um, uh, a, a, a poster of different kinds of folk costumes you might see around the world. And, um, and so you get a sense of, you know, what is a folk costume? Well, you can imagine that uh, people from around the world, when they see a Mackinac coat, they instantly think uh, Canada, and they may even think North America, you know, because the Americans uh, really appreciate it too. Um, because, you know, the, uh, where it was born was the overlap of Canada and America anyway. Um, and uh, for indigenous peoples, we've never really, uh, there, there weren't those boundaries in the old days. It was Turtle Island, uh, as we call it today, or Mackinac, as we uh, might use uh, that term as well. So here, here we have, uh, I'm, I live uh, just across the river from Ottawa, and this is our mascot for our, uh, our CFL football team uh, called the Red Blacks, which I will also do a shout out to uh, Jackie and Diane Godoy because their dad was the commissioner of the CFL back in the 70s and 80s and helped to resurrect that league. So uh, anyway, we have this, uh, this fellow, this, I, th this mascot was originally going to be called uh, Joe Muffra, but uh, there's a bit of an outcry uh, on the French uh, from the French community, so they just call him Big Joe. And uh, anyway, it's kind of neat. Uh, it's it's part of the uh, local lore. I mean, we had a lot of logging going on here. And uh, this final uh, slide here, you see me and my grandfather's curling Mackinac coat with the white one. Uh, we see uh, my cousin Dzungé and Asana, Paul Schilling. Uh, in my uh, great grandfather's uh, uh, Mackinac coat, uh, just as a reminder that uh, this coat was worn by First Nations as well, and uh, and as it would have been traded. And then there's uh, my my cousin Frank Kehoe, uh, and there he is uh, pointing to something. This is a great shot because he was just pointing at something. I don't know. He looks like he's uh, a scout there in his own apartment, which is something. And I really, <laughs> you know, I, that's fantastic. And then this is a fellow I met uh, Christmas shopping at Perfect Books in Ottawa. And uh, Christopher, he was visiting his sister from Kelowna and he was wearing his father's Hudson Bay Mackinac coat. Now this could have actually been made in Aurelia by the Cars Mackinac company because it's from the 1960s. Nice thick one. And I thought, there you go, you got this young fellow and he recognizes that this has style. I asked him, you know, why he's wearing it. And he says, I just liked it. It was my dad's coat and you know, why not? So, uh, you know, every generation is reclaiming this coat as part of uh, their, fa their fashion. And, uh, and it really is part of the Canadian identity, uh, which is the blending of these different influences uh, that uh, made the coat, but also made Canada. Very cool. Um, now, some of these coats are actually on display across from me. So um, I'm going to switch to my other my other computer here. Very high tech right now. And um, John, would you give us a little tour of the coats that we have on display? Okay. So this first one here, that's uh, done in the, I think it's called the Queen Anne's uh, stripes. For, that's uh, associated uh, with Hudson Bay Company a lot, but you see different blanket coat companies using that, that striping uh, design as well. And this is basically a, a coat that's been, or a blanket that's been turned into a coat. So all parts of the blanket are, have been made into the coat. And I've actually worn that uh, even on ice flows floating down the Ottawa River. We sometimes do that in the spring when the ice is thick enough uh, just to amuse the, <laughs> the neighbors. Um, so I've worn that one uh, on those kinds of things, but it's very warm uh, when you go snowshoeing through the woods. Um, the other one, the red one, uh, this is a uh, Cars Mackinac uh, jack jacket. You see the little epaulets there on the shoulders. That's kind of a military uh, 
uh, throw, call, you know, flourish there. Um, the, the, the collar that can be turned up uh, when it's cold. And again, lots of pockets. Um, I have another coat, I'll show you this later, but it, it actually has pockets that fit in the back where you can stick squirrels and rabbits even, or ammunition uh, if you want. So that's something that my grandfather would have worn something like that when he went fishing at uh, Duck Lakes. Uh, I think that's called Lake Dalrymple now. And, uh, and the code to the right, that's my, uh, as we're migrating there, that's my uh, great grandfather Charles's coat, which my grandfather Joe also inherited. And that's a Cars Mackinac as well. And, uh, and there's the little embosser. And <laughs> this is- Sorry. This is like <laughs> Dr. Tung from SCTV. <laughs> I don't know if anybody knows that reference. And some of the panels that, that Lindsay and I developed, so that was nice. And then if you can turn around to the Buffalo check one, this is like the coat that I inherited from my Aunt Mary Lou, a beautiful young woman who died too young. But um, anyway, I inherited that and I wore it for many years. And eventually I grew it and one of my girlfriends uh, stole it from me. Uh, but anyway, or, or I gave it to her, I guess. So um, anyway, that's the one that a lot of people are familiar with as the Mackinac coat. And, you know, you see this, that kind of coat being worn uh, by bands, you know, rock bands or Marlon Brando and on the waterfront. Um, there's different variations of it that are quite cool. I have, um, let's see if I can put this here. I have this um, Hudson Bay book. You can see in some of the, they hired these uh, designers to do updated versions of the Mackinac coat and uh, for women. So uh, I think that's just, you know, that's quite something. But this is, this is kind of a more styled cut one. I'm mean, gonna have to lose a bit of weight so I can fit it better, but I, I can still kind of wear it, yeah. And this is the one I, yeah, this is the one where it has this pocket. And I was like, what an odd place for a pocket. Like how, what are you gonna do? Stick your hands in your back as you're walking? Like, but no, that's for, that's for a small game I found. Uh, an ad where they were advertising that the pockets could be used for a small game. And uh, so really you could, you could go walk in the bush and if you, um, you got hungry, you just reach behind you, grab a squirrel and uh, close it up. Now, the other thing I think are kind of cool are these, uh, these are, these are uh, Mackinac shirts, they call them. So some, some people call it the uh, Northern Tuxedo. So this is a Woolrich brand one. And uh, I got it at Sporting Life on sale. So I'm really, really happy with that. So again, this doesn't have the pockets down here. So it's the difference between a shirt and a coat is it's got, it doesn't have all the pockets all the time like you would with the coat. It's a bit thinner. You could wear it under a coat and uh, and uh, it's something that I, I would probably wear around this time of year, except today when it was super hot, but when it's cooler. And, uh, and this is the most recent um, Hudson Bay Mackinac style coat. I got this in uh, at one of their shops in Vancouver. It's basically a thin fleece with the uh, Buffalo check design. So the Mackinac continues in different <laughs> manners. Um, John, we've got a couple of questions coming in here. Okay. Um, so uh, we've got Susanna. Um, she says, thank you for the terrific presentation. So thank you for being with us, Susanna. Um, two quick questions. The first one is a great question that I, I have not even thought of before. Um, the Hudson's Bay Point blanket has four stripes of different colors do you know if these stripes have any meaning uh the band like the like the uh the, the, the big bands of color but the big bands are the small bands so the big bands um i think that's just something that uh i think that's just something that people liked i guess now the one thing to keep in mind is these blankets were designed for indigenous people largely so they're the colors and the stripes would have been the uh, 
would have been what they attracted them and they would ask for that even so it so that may even be lost in history for somebody to dig up in an archive somewhere maybe in in britain because uh, uh a lot of these blankets were made in in britain and uh and then brought over here okay um and the other question uh from susanna is do you know what the approximate value of the Mackinac blanket would be in today's money? Was it considered a luxury item? Was it an expensive trading item for First Nations people? It's uh, interesting in that, yeah, they were, I remember reading about this, that they were, they were expensive. You know, you look back on it and some people were saying, oh, they, they ripped, they were ripping off the uh, First Nations with the cost of, of the blankets. But uh, actually, when you look at the cost of how much money it took to make the blankets in relation to how much time it took to do the trapping and the hunting, uh, they found that actually it was a really good deal. In fact, it was the, uh, it was the, it was the British uh, 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 workers that actually were getting ripped off <laughs> in that whole transaction that that actually it was economically uh the first nations uh, got the better of the of the bargain interesting um we have a question from debbie who says um how long was karst mackinac producing the mackinac coat uh that would have been 66 years from 1897 to 1963 nice good quick math um, okay, folks, if you do have other questions, you're welcome to drop them in uh, the Q&A um, or the chat. Um, John, I have one here that was submitted in advance as well from Janet, who says, I'm very curious to know how many locations we know of where the Hudson's Bay uh, cloth blankets and coats were made. I am aware of a place near Whitney in Oxfordshire, England. Oh, from when yeah. I lived in England. Well, the Whitney blankets were famous, yes, and the, they were used by uh, Hudson Bay coat, uh, coat manufacturers. They would have been used by many blanket coat uh, manufacturers, the Whitney one, but they were all over the place. And then the other thing too is Canada started developing its own, uh, its own blanket uh, uh, manufacturing industry as well. I know in Ottawa, they had one here at the Rideau River where I sometimes go paddling. There's um, up in uh, Mackinac even they had a they had a, a manufacturer of blankets up there too, which became known as Mackinac wool. So these Mackinac woolens uh, actually were used for the manufacture of, of Mackinac coats. There's a big uh, manufacturing operation down in Chicago. There's one even out west now called Filson, and they still make them. Uh, Woolrich is another manufacturer. Um, it's something where a lot of international manufacturers are are, uh, are coming on on stream as well, using wool, you know high qual quality wools from all over. Um, the funny thing about it is, uh, you know, we look at the fur trade and we think Canada was founded on two fashion crazes. Uh, one was the top hat, you know, the beaver felt top hat. Well, that wasn't so much worn by Canadians out there in the woods uh, as it was by Europeans. Uh, so we shipped all that felt out, out to, uh, or, or the beaver pelts, out to Europe for them to make their own hats. And they shipped us the blankets that we made into the into our coats. So again, it's kind of, it's, you know, international trade back then. But, you know, Canada was founded on a, on fashion, on a fashion industry. And really the significance of the Cars Mackinac Company is there you have uh, resource extraction, which is the logging. And uh, of course, it was destroying the First Nations hunting grounds and uh, fishing weirs. But uh, but um, but the industry of Virilia um, started it, its manufacturing started with companies like the Cars Mackinac Company that were starting to ma manufacture products that they could uh, sell around the world. So I mean, you you can find these coats, the Cars Mackinac coat. If you go online and you do a search on eBay, you can find vendors of these coats all the way from uh britain to japan it's quite amazing wow well that actually um that that answers donna's question that's here which is where could i buy an Aurelia made mackinac coat today 
Well, look for the Cars Mackinac name. So that's C-A-R-S-S. And um, you're going to be paying, if you're lucky, around $200. Uh, but you can pay as much as $700 for them. Uh, I would say a good price is somewhere around $400. It's kind of nice because you get to wear uh, uh, an artifact from your region that's warm. Uh, the color stays. Look at the color of that. That's like a 100-year-old jacket behind you. And it's still got that that warmth, warm, warm red color. And, uh, and even when they fade, it's like the old uh, Scottish tartans that fade. They have their own, they, their own uh, character to them as well. Now, I'd like to also, I, I know some people ask me about the importance of the Mackinac uh, jacket as regalia for the Great Lakes Métis. And I think this is very important to look at it as a symbol of the Great Lakes Métis. Now, the Great Lakes Métis are kind of a, uh, misunderstood people, you know, are there really Métis in Ontario? Some people from out West have said, uh, especially in Manitoba, because there's different ways of looking at Métis. Uh, you know, there's the Louis Riel's uh, Red River um, nation there, but there's, but before that there was, um, or around the same time and a bit before there was the Great Lakes Métis. And as I illustrated, they were involved in that, in that war of uh, battle in the war of 1812. And if it wasn't for that battle, all Métis would have been under threat in Canada from American uh, expansion. So, you know, there was Métis, there were Great Lakes Métis. They uh, can be almost identified, uh, uh, well, they can be identified uh, with this coat because they were there. It was designed by one of their own. And its, it's distribution throughout uh, North America or through Canada and part of the United States uh, is an example of where uh, the Great Lakes Métis ended up migrating. So uh, some people say, well, you know, there aren't any Métis from south of Sault Ste. Marie. Uh, well, actually, a lot of them that were south of Sault Ste. Marie uh, moved to uh, Manitoba, but some of them also moved down to Penetanguishing and Aurelia area to set up fur trading operations. Um, yeah, John, any parting words? Well, I just want to thank... Uh, Paul Schilling de Zange, who uh, uh, painted these pieces over my shoulder. For, so thank you for that backdrop. And, uh, and modeled and this model, jacket. Yes, yes. And I, I look forward to visiting all my cousins. Well, thank you so much, John. Thanks, everybody. Um, and uh, have a great night. Take care, everyone.